Amen. So as we go into this topic today, the title of the message today is Civilization Reborn, All Things New. And we will see why I titled it this as we go through the message this morning. And so I would invite you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8 as we prepare for prayer. And when you are there, say amen. Romans chapter 8. And welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Romans chapter 8. And we will pray. All right. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts and minds. Lord, you know that we are coming from a week that has been trying. Many of us are coming from situations that, Lord, we may not want to be in. We're coming from hardships that we may not want to experience. And I pray, O oh God, that as we go through your word today, you might instill in us hope and faith and love. Lord, inspire us to live for you regardless of the circumstances. Knowing that, Lord, this world will come to an end. And that there is a new beginning that you have in store for all those who trust in you. Keep us, and Lord, hide me that I may not be seen, but rather that Jesus will be uplifted and all will be drawn to him. This is what I pray and I ask. In Jesus Christ's name, let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. So you're with me in your Bibles in Romans chapter 8. And as we go through our subject today, the way that we can lay this out is in a few parts. We're first going to look at the prerequisite to restoration. So there's a time coming when God will restore all things and make all things new. But there's a prerequisite to that coming. And we'll see that in light of that prerequisite, there's a part that we have to play in this restoration. And then two, we'll, come, we'll talk about coming together every week in this place where this restoration happens. Coming together every month. And then builders in the new world, and we'll summarize everything that we've looked at. And we'll see that the, the middle three coming together every week, every month, and builders in the new world, we'll see what that means as we go forth. We'll look at some facts concerning the new earth that God is going to prepare for his people. A new beginning, not just for us, but a new beginning for the entire planet itself. And so as you're with me in your Bibles, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. That's the first scripture that you have, the prerequisite to restoration. Now I want you to look at this. This is really powerful. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where? In us. So we're literally looking at Paul saying here to the church in Rome. He's saying that the sufferings that we experience in this life is not, God is, God is saying you can't even compare it. Rather than a comparison, we would say that it's a contrast because it's so different to the glory that's coming. And the glory that will be revealed where? In you and I. Right? So it says here, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of whom? The sons of God. Now, you have that in your Bibles. Um, you're in the text there in Romans chapter 8. Now, I want you to see how one becomes a son of God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, just a few verses up, it says... For as many as are led by whom? The Spirit of God. They are what? The sons of God. So in order to become a son of God, what do you have to have? The Spirit of God. And so this is why the onus is on us to cry out for the Holy Ghost. That's why we need the Spirit of God leading us in our lives. And as we come to Jesus and surrender to him, God gives to us his spirit 
And as the Spirit works in us, the glory of God is then revealed in our lives. That's why we truly, friends, each morning we should pray to God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon me. Because we never know how God desires to use us in that very day. Right? I'll tell you guys something, a testimony from last week. Last week, I went to a, a church to speak with some other speakers, and we were given about 30 minutes each to give a message. And so I was like, man, what can I share in that time? And I have to summarize everything as I'm sharing it. So those of you who know in our church today, um, this was the first person I've ever baptized, the only person I've ever baptized. Do you guys know who it is? Sister Janet, right? <laughs> um, that is something I will never forget. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> so that happened. So as we were studying, I remember the first time and, and um, as I was coming to the church, I would see Sister Janet coming and she was devoted and praise the Lord for the witness of her son Eric as Eric and her connected and, and of course always being there for her and she came she would come to the church and she would sit here and I was wondering man like wow she's so committed and so one day I went up to her and she was in I believe it was the Bible study room and I went up to her I talked to Eric first and then I went into the room and I said I sat down right beside her and I said hey sister Janet would you be interested in Bible studies and sister Janet was like yeah, right? She was totally for it. So we started studying together, and she was, she really, there were so many things that she already understood, along with what we were going through. And as we were going through it, she then made the choice to fully commit to coming to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And she was ultimately baptized, and so that was her experience in a snapshot. Now, last week, I went to a place to preach. Now, my time came to speak, and I, I told you guys how much time you do, you ha do I have? 30. 30 minutes. Now, that's hard for a preacher, all right? So I was like, Lord, help me to synthesize what I'm trying to say, to summarize it. And so I'm speaking there, and I'm touching on different points, and I'm like, man, I wish I had more than 30 minutes. But I had to do what I had to do, right? Ultimately, I went like five to six minutes over I looked at the guy who was in charge of the program, and I said, hey, by the time I got to five minutes over, I'm like, hey, how much time do I have? And he was like, do you see the clock, brother? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap up. So I'm about to wrap up, and I'm telling the story of Sister Janet. And as I'm telling the story, I'm thinking, man, Lord, this is not having any impact. And so I finish the message. I sit down. And friends, it was so powerful because God gave it to me in two doses and showing me your work is in love to share the word and then leave the consequences with me, Amen. right? Don't worry about how many were impacted. Just give the message. And so I found out there was a gentleman actually in the audience. I didn't, I didn't know, but it was a twofold situation. I have always been praying to the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, it's two situations that I desire to truly impact people in a specific way and two groups of people. One is the general populace and one is specifically. And I wasn't, wasn't going to mention this, but I'll mention it in the, in the sermon today. One group that I desired to impact. I said, Lord, so many times we get up in the pulpit and we bash this group. Rather than asking the Lord, how can I come close to this specific community to truly minister to them? And it is the LGBTQIA plus community. Many times as we preach, friends, it is easy to get up into the pulpit and bash this community. And in no way am I saying that the Bible condones the lifestyle of this community. But friends, it is harder to come close and to practice Christ's method alone 
in coming close and winning the confidence of people and leading them out of a certain way of living to finally surrender their lives to the Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a big difference. And so I was giving the message and there was an individual in the crowd that was part of this community. I had no idea. I actually looked out into the, into the, the crowd and I saw the person and I did not know who this person was. But she was sitting next to an individual that was preaching. The person had invited her. And as the sermon ended and I sat down, the sister that was sitting next to the person from this community came up to me and they said, Akeem, she can't stop talking about the message. Because my emphasis was the love of God. The love of God for the sinner and to win the sinner from sin. And so as she was, look, as she was listening, I saw the person's head nodding, but I, I couldn't make out whether the person was receiving it or not. And then after I found out that she had totally received it. And so I pray, friends, that that seed being planted, that it will grow. My friends, God, more than wanting us to speak, he wants us to live. Live a life that can show people, I love you. I may not agree with what you're doing, but I love you intensely. And I want to draw close to you. That's a challenge I want to place before us. Ask the Lord to help you to come close to the people that you intensely disagree with. And have him challenge your experience and the experience of that person. That's my prayer for us, friends. Because how many does God want to save? All. All. Right? And so, having said that, that was, a, that was a taste for what would happen on the next day. So the next day, I'm doing some, some work. And as I'm working, I'm sitting there and, uh, and I'm, I'm waiting for something else to happen. And a lady calls me randomly. And she, as she calls, I answer the phone and she says to me, she says, is this Akeem James? I said, yeah, 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 this is Akeem. And I said, Who, who's speaking? And she says, I was at the church yesterday. And I was like, what? Oh, man, praise God. I hope you were blessed. And she was like, yes, I was blessed by your message. And so I said, I said, well, she said, she started telling me her story. And she says, my name is Janet. And she says, not only is my name Janet, but I am the same age as the lady that you mentioned. And then she says, I'm currently in the very predicament now that she was in when making the decision to fully commit to becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. And so friends, as I'm, as I'm sitting there, I'm like, what in the world? Because I didn't even, I didn't know I was speaking to her. But she said, I almost fell out of my chair as I was listening to your message. Because I was like, God is like literally talking to me specifically right now and telling me, make a choice. There's someone with your very name who went through your very experience that made the choice. That what? Same age. Same age that made the decision. To fully commit. Will you do that? And so friends, as I'm, I'm listening to her, I'm like, Lord, I got off the phone and I was just like, I was in like a hallway and I literally wanted to like run all around the hallway. Like it jumping in joy, but I contained myself. I was like, let's not do that. Right? So, so I, I sat down and I was thinking about it and I was like, Lord, I got up there. And I thought I was a total failure. I thought it was just like there was no impact. And I didn't feel anything. But God was showing me at that moment. It's not about feeling. You just have to deliver the message. And as long as you lift up my son, it will impact many. Amen. Friends, 
My prayer for us today is that we will be what this text mentions, that we would actually manifest the character of God, whether it be in message, in a sermon, whether it be in our daily lives, with people that we come into contact with, there is a manifestation of God's character that must be given through us. Why? Because the text tells us, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So what does that mean? That means that when we talk about the creation, what are we talking about? Can anybody tell me? Yes, right? Us, we're talking about God's creation, right? The whole world. But what is the world waiting for? Us. They're waiting for the revelation of God's character in you and I. So why is it that the creation is waiting? Here's why. For the creation was subjected to futility. Some of your Bibles have the word vanity. That means aimlessness. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, what is that saying? That's saying, basically, that the creation understands more than even the Christian understands. That if the Christian lives for God and allows God to reveal himself in their lives, what will happen is not only will men receive a revelation of that character and be drawn to God, But it then says, the creation understands that the more men reveal the character of God, the closer we are to the end. Do you see that? The creation is understanding that if we manifest God's character, the end will come sooner. And the sooner the end comes, the closer the creation is to being restored to what it was prior to the fall. So you and I have a huge part to play in the end of the world. The end of this present world as it is. A world filled with suffering. A world filled with trials and hardships. God is saying to us, if you live for me, let a generation rise up that becomes tired of living in this world and totally commits to Jesus. And I tell you the truth, that is the generation in which the world will end. God is waiting on a people that will totally commit to him. Why? Because he knows that when we live for him, the more we live for him, God says, I can end this thing quickly. Now, Saying that, having said that, I'm going to ask you the question. So it says, for the creation was subjected to futility or to vanity, to aimlessness. When did that happen? The fall, right? Now, the fall happened, why? Because of disobedience, right? Because of sin. First on the part of Eve, and then on the part of? Adam, right? And it's not, it's interesting, it's not until Adam partook of the fruit that the fall happened, right? So we have this situation where the world is now subjected to vanity, to aimlessness, to sin. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So in other words, God looking at the world and seeing it being subjected to sin, he says, this is not the end. I've allowed this to happen, but I have a plan, and that plan will be executed. And because that plan will be executed, friends, we have hope that one day all things will be made new, right? So this is what the text is revealing to us, that the creation, therefore, is saying, I know it's coming, but I know that all things will be made new only in response to man being made new. It is only when the redeemed come so close to God that they begin revealing who he is that the creation knows my redemption is coming. Okay? So, 
You can say it this way. Romans 8 reveals that in order for the current order of things to pass away, that's your first answer, in order for the current order of things to pass away and the new heavens and the new earth to be established, the people of God must manifest his what? Character to a fallen world that all who would be drawn to God may have the opportunity to come to him. The redemption of man leads to the restoration of the planet itself. Does that make sense? Right? And that's why I said the, the creation is waiting for that revelation because there's a sequence, friends. The Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. But before any, but for all to come to salvation, right? And repentance, I should say, right? So for all to come to repentance, all must first receive a revelation. The people out in the world must be able to see the character of God in you and I. And once they see that character, the gospel lived out, then they can make a choice. An educated decision as to whether they will receive Christ or reject him. Because we know that at the end of time, there's only going to be how many groups? Two. The one who follows God and the one who rejects him. But what causes that division is a revelation in your life and mine. The world must first see the gospel, make its decision, become polarized, and then the end comes. So as we look at this, we're seeing that, wow, okay, so I play a part, Lord. There's a part that I play. And if I... Connect with you as a co-laborer with you. That part which I play will have such a powerful effect that as it says in the book of Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. That's revelation. And then the end will come. In other words, the end is not coming unless there is a Revelation. So friends, I want to say to you, I want to propose this to you. Yes, we must look at the signs of the times that are taking place all around us because these are signs of the end. They're signs that we're living in the end of time, but there is only one sign that brings the end. There are signs of the end, but there's only one sign that brings the end. And that is the sign of the witness. This gospel of the kingdom going forth as a witness. Then shall the end come. In other words, the end is certain. But it's also conditional. Do you see that? Unless God gives that witness. If he ends the world, let's say God gets tired one day, which is how many presented. God just gets tired one day and he gets up and he just said, ready or not, here I come. Friends, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God gives men an opportunity by a witness and then he brings destruction if the witness is rejected. The same thing happened to the generation of Noah's day going up all the way to Moses' time. God said through Abraham, I will give the Amorites 430 years to repent. And you could expect that God gave witnesses. You could expect that he brought conviction. But when the Amorites rejected the message or the convictions of God, by the time Moses and the Israelites left Egypt. The time was coming. Slowly but surely, they got to the borders of Canaan. And the Amorites were filled with fear. And ultimately, they were destroyed. But the destruction came after God had given a time of mercy. That's how God works, friends. God's anger is not like our anger. It's not that God just gets up one day and he says, I'm fed up with this world. No, friends. 
God gives time. He gives a witness. And based on the response to the witness, what's that? He sends his prophets. And if you don't listen, then the end and the judgment comes. Therefore, may we be God's witnesses. And as we are God's witnesses to the world and the world makes their choice, then God says, all right, now that I have a people that reveal my character and the world has either accepted or rejected that revelation, now we can bring it to a close. Because... Even if I gave them, God will get to the point where he sees that even if I gave them another million years, they still will not turn. So then he ends it. Does that make sense? Right? So more than final events, God is looking for a witness. Once the witness is established, friends, you will be shocked at how quickly the final events will go. But he needs a witness. All right, so let's go for it. Now, once God has this witness, the world makes this decision, and then Jesus comes and the world ends, there are a few things that take place. But the next great work that God will do is that he will recreate all things. All right? So there's a time coming where the Bible says that God will make a new heaven and a new earth. And when he makes this new heaven and new earth, if we are redeemed, and my prayer is that we will be redeemed, that we will trust in Jesus so much so that we will be a part of this new creation. All right? Now, I want you to see there are a few facts that I wanted us to look at as we see what will be involved in this new creation. So the world ends there's a time span that goes between that and then God creates a new heaven and a new earth. So what is in that new heaven and new earth? So I want you to take your Bibles and go with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, we're going to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, all right? And when you are there, say amen. All right? Isaiah chapter 66, all right? Amen, amen. Isaiah chapter 66, and we will start off from verse 22. And this is how we know we're talking about the future here. It says in verse 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So are we talking about the future here? Yes, because it's the new heaven and the new earth, right? Now watch what happens in the new heaven and the new earth. And this is very interesting. It says, verse 22, verse 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, we're going to come back to that, but then it says, And from one what? Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So do you see it? In the new heaven and the new earth, will we still be keeping the Sabbath? Yes. So friends, this thing that God established, now remember, when did God establish the Sabbath? Creation, Creation right? Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. God rested, he blessed the day, and he sanctified it. Before there was any Jew, before there was any Israelite, God established the Sabbath day for whose sake? Our sake. For the Sabbath was made for who? Man. And not man for the Sabbath. All right? So God says, what I established in Eden, I will restore it in the world to come. And this is why he's preparing us for that time by asking us to keep the Sabbath when? Now. And so this is why I emphasize that the Sabbath is different from all of the other laws that Moses had. This is part of the Ten Commandments. And God says, in light of that, I am saying to you to keep it today so that it will prepare you for heaven. And by the way, friends, where will heaven ultimately be? Here on earth, right? A new heaven and a new earth. So, 
we're seeing here that God is saying that one aspect of the new, this new, this recreation of the world will be that the Sabbath will still be there. All right, so that's your answer for that one. Isaiah chapter 66, specifically verse 22 and 23. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23. All right, so we're seeing one of the glorious things that we'll do in heaven when the world is made new is that we will enjoy the Sabbath day in heaven. But you remember, as I said, the only way that we can finally get to that point is that there must be a revelation first where? In us, right? So the redemption of the world happens when man is redeemed. God recreates the world when he has a witness in humanity. So as we continue, we're seeing here, there's not only that we will keep the Sabbath, but you remember it says there in verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another. So I was like, whoa, new moon. I thought we don't keep the feast days anymore. Right? And is that true though? We don't, right? So I was like wondering, what does this mean? And so I went and I looked it up and I realized that what it's saying here is that in the new earth, we will gather together from one new moon to another. The Hebrew word for new moon actually means monthly. So that's your answer there. Monthly. It actually means monthly. Revelation 22 and verse 2 reveals to us why we gather together from one month to another. All right? Can anybody guess why we gather together from one month to another? Okay, so one is fellowship, but we'll be doing... What's, what's one of the greatest ways to have fellowship even in our world right now? Yeah, who said that? Who said that? A feast, right? The best way... To have the best fellowship is over food. And friends, that's what we'll be doing. So go in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Friends, this is amazing. What will we be doing? Why is it that we gather every month? Check this out. It says in Revelation chapter 22 and verses 1 and 2. And friends, this is why we want to be there. You are going through hardships in this life. How can we go through hardships in this life, pain in this life, struggles in this life, standing for Jesus in this life only to lose out? No, we must make it there. We must make it. So Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2, when you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, it says there, and he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Proceeding out of where? The throne of God and of the Lamb. No wonder it's called the water of life. Because who is it proceeding from? God, right? It's proceeding from the Lamb himself as well. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus being life, anything that comes forth from him is life. Right? So it says here, now check this out. It says, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river of the water of life was there the tree of life. So not just the water of life, but the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit how, when? Every month. Every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So you see why we're gathering? Yeah. We're gathering to partake of the tree of life. Every month bearing new fruit. Now, friends, it is in light of this that I want to present something to you. And don't get mad at me, all right? I'm just saying what the Bible says, okay? <laughs> now, correct me, okay? Watch this. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bear 12 manner of burgers. No, ev no. 12 manner of Philly cheesesteak. No. Are you sure? No. 12 manner of fruit. Right? 
So this means, what is, what is this telling you? All right, you, you deduce it for me. It's a healthy diet. It's a healthy diet. <laughs> and in heaven, what is that telling you though? There's going to be no meat, friends. <laughs> Maybe cabbage, <laughs> right? So, friends, we're realizing God is even going to bring us back to the original diet, right? So, why not prepare? Right? <laughs> right? So, God is trying to prepare us. All of this stuff, he's trying to prepare us for what's to come, right? So we're seeing, wow, friends, we're not going to only gather weekly. Can you imagine coming together, as we said, from one Sabbath to another, all the redeemed to worship together before God's throne? But not just that, every month coming together at the tree of life and eating from that tree, every single month, a new fruit. This tells me, that the mind of God is infinite. He never runs out of new things to give us. This is why in heaven we'll never be bored. You can't wait what? Yeah. That, <laughs> this is going to be so interesting, friends. And that's why I'm re-emphasizing the point. We have to make it there. We cannot miss out on this. All right? By God's grace. All right, so now we're, we're going to look at something. Sister Nicole prepared us for this question. All right, so we've seen that according to Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2, we will not only be drinking of the water of life, but we will be partaking of the tree of life. And one of the reasons that it's called the water of life and tree of life is because when we partake of it, it perpetuates life. This is how immortality will be sustained in the kingdom. There will be no disease there. The very leaves of the tree are edible. Because it says it's for the healing of the, of the nations. So everything that we partake of will only be giving life to us. Now another thing that we'll be doing is this. We will be builders in the new world. All right? Now one of the things that it mentions in Revelation chapter 21 is that in the new earth, does anyone know what will be the capital of the new earth? This is not in your notes, but I think somebody may have mentioned it. The new Jerusalem, right? So the city of God will be the very capital of this world. Friends, when you actually do the measurements, you guys should do that at some point. You read Revelation 21 and you do the measurements of the holy city. And you realize that it will be so high. That before you ever even enter into the atmosphere of earth, you can see the city penetrating through the atmosphere itself. Friends, it will be so beautiful. And so God says, you will have a home in that city, right? Jesus says in John chapter 14, I believe it's in verse 1, in my father's house there are many mansions, if it were not so, I would not have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. That if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. All right? So we have a home in the city. But I want you to check this out. This is so mind-blowing because I was like, Lord, I'm pushing for this in this life. But I know if I don't get it in this life... I'll have it in the kingdom. All right? So check this out. So in your Bibles, I want you to check out the book of Isaiah once again. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. All right? Isaiah chapter 65. And we're going to look starting from verse 17. Because some may say, okay, Akeem, how do you know this is in the new world? So we'll start from verse 17, and when you're there, say amen. amen. All right. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. So, so are we in the future? Yes. yes. 
when all things are restored, it says, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And get this, friends, this is not because God all of a sudden, he comes and he just wipes out your memory. It's because the glories of the kingdom will be so amazing that nothing in this world can compare to it. So it's removed not by force, but by glory. Or by the glory of the Lord. So it says here, so we're in the new heaven and the new earth. Now skip down to verse 21. So we're in the new heavens and the new earth. Now look at what we're doing there. It says, and they, that is the redeemed. That's us. By God's grace, right? And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Friends, you shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord. And their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullet. So, <laughs> so what are we finding out here? Even the lion is going to be vegetarian. <laughs> Do you see that? Friends, even the lion... <laughs> is going to be a vegetarian. <laughs> All right, so it continues by saying, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my mountain, saith the Lord. Back to the original creation. No death. But friends, you see that, that first part? Not only will you have a home in the city, but friends, you will be able in the new earth to build your own homes. Friends, you will lack nothing mentally. You will lack nothing spiritually. You, what's that? You'll be whole, right? Nothing physically. All of the resources of the world at your disposal. That's what God is planning for you. Some of you today, you're going through situations where even if you are solid spiritually and you are solid mentally, you lack things. Whether it be financially, whether it be in some physical way. But God says, if you hang on with me, there is a day coming where you will lack nothing. You will have everything your heart could desire. And the beautiful thing about that time is that our characters will be so refined that all we could desire is what God desires. And what God desires is the best for each and every one of us. My prayer today is that as we have looked at this, that friends, it will encourage us to be faithful to Christ. The ultimate incentive for following God, however is not on this sheet as we close. All these are incentives. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> this is all of the stuff you're going to receive and more. But friends, I want to implore each and every one of us. The greatest reason you want to be in heaven is not because of what you can get, but because of the person you can have before you get there. The ultimate reward of heaven is not the houses. It is not the city. It is Jesus. And Jesus loves you right here today. Even as you are, Christ loves you. And he wants to do a work in your life and mine. Regardless of how much we may have sinned. Regardless of what evil we may have done. Christ's goal is to get you there. It is powerful when we read the story of Abraham. Abraham leaves the land of the Chaldees. 
And as he leaves, God tells him the promise God gives him, which becomes a powerful incentive for him to go forth into the unknown, is that God tells him, I will give you a great amount of descendants. Yes. And I will give you someone through whom those descendants will come. He says, Abraham, one day Abraham leaves. As he leaves, he comes out of his tent and he looks up into the sky. And he says, if you can number this, the stars in the sky, you can number your descendants. And of course, he couldn't, right? That was the point. And so Abraham, following God, he said, man, God, I know you're going to give me this. And I'm going to follow you because this is what I truly want. But then there comes a time, and I believe it's in Genesis 15, where after Abraham has been following God out in the unknown for a long time, God tells Abraham this. He says, Abraham, I am your reward. I am your exceeding great reward. We must get to the point in our Christian walk where above all the incentives of the world, Jesus becomes the ultimate incentive to get to heaven. The Bible tells us that when we get there, actually not scripture, there's a powerful book by the name of Great Controversy. And it tells us the scripture bears this point out as well. For when God made Adam and Eve, this was his purpose for them. It was that they would continually increase in their intellect and understanding. And this is the statement here, and you have it on your sheets. It says, speaking of the world to come, the new heaven and new earth, it says, their immortal minds will contemplate with never failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There is no cruel, deceiving foe to tempt the forgetful to tempt to forgetfulness of God every faculty will be developed every capacity increased the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies friends do you see that that means when we get there you will never grow tired you will never grow exhausted and there will never be any tempter to lead us to forget God. There will only be that which continually leads the mind back to God. And here's the thing about it. Here's the beautiful thing. I always think about it this way because before I came into the Seventh-day Adventist movement, I, I didn't know any of these things. But when I came in, I began to realize that many of these Hollywood films, they tried to copy this. But they, they pollute it. Because they make the future look like it's going to be havoc. And you don't want to live there. But friends, I began to realize this. This is so powerful. Can you imagine what you will be in a billion years? What kind of intellect you will have as time goes on for eternity? We read in, in a powerful book by the name of Early Writings, it states that Lucifer himself, before his fall, because he stood so close to the presence of God, it was manifested, his intellect was manifested in his very forehead. In other words, you've probably seen it in different cartoons, the more a person takes in what happens to their head, it gets bigger, right? Now, in the kingdom, as you learn more and more, and even today in modern science it is revealed, as you learn more and more, your brain itself develops and grows. Your frontal lobe increases in its capacity of understanding. Friends, you will be an order of being that you cannot even imagine. Because that's what we were made for. Infinite development. Never ending capacity to learn. And so as we close here today, my prayer for us is that we will make it. And that not only will we know that Jesus desires to give us a new beginning now. 
no matter where we're coming from. But he's saying, if you hold on to me, you will see the beginning, a new beginning when I make all things new. How many of you today would say with me that you want to be there? Yeah. Amen. 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 I saw two hands go up. All right. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, I pray, O oh God, that Lord, we will know today that you love us and that you have a plan for us, not only in this world, but in the world to come. A world made new because we were first made new. We were restored and with our restoration comes the restoration of this entire planet. Father, I pray that, Lord, we will hold out to the very end. That we will hold on to you with all of our heart. Help us to not give up. Help us to know that, Lord, there's a part that you have for us to play. This is why we were born. We were brought into existence because there is a plan that you have for us. Help us to come into connection with you that that plan may be fulfilled. Keep us, Lord, and guide us, we pray. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.